Welcome Weirdos, I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. And as I'm sure you can already tell, this is a <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> this is a fireside frights episode. Uh, once a month I come to you without any of the fancy production and creepy music. It's just you, me, this campfire, and whatever Mother Nature wants to send our way for background noise. And all stories on Fireside Frights episodes are submitted by you, the listeners of the podcast, my weirdo family. And I can always use more. In fact, I'm going to use everything that's been sent to me over the last few weeks in this episode. Since I had my computer crash a few weeks ago, I lost a lot of Fireside Frights episodes, uh, or Fireside Frights stories, that is. I was able to uh, gather up most of them, and if you have not heard your story yet on Fireside Frights and you don't hear it tonight, that means that it was lost in the computer crash, so please send it again. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to enter contests, to connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Our first story comes from Sarah. Hi Darren, while listening to Volume 15 of your Fireside Frights series, by the way that was our previous episode, uh, she says, you mentioned wanting to hear stories about dreams, and I have a couple. The experiences are very close to my heart, so I took some time to think over whether I wanted to share them, and after a lot of thought, I realized that both of the dreams have a common thread of depression, so if I were ever going to share them, Weird Darkness would be the best place, since these involve both depression as a lived experience and losing a loved one to suicide. My first dream happened when I was under general anesthesia. I was in my 30s and in a very bad place emotionally, and much of the pain was due to my marriage being very unhealthy. I was going through the kind of sadness that you push down and just tread water, and everyone around you can see things aren't good, but you're too tired to recognize it. While under the anesthesia, I found myself in a white place, not a room, not outside, just a place with absolutely no scenery. My grandmother was there, and by the time this dream came to me, she had been gone about 15 years. I'd been very close to my grandma, and in a lot of ways, she was the only person I really knew loved me enough to be invested in me and make me feel like I belonged somewhere when I was young. In the dream, we had our greetings and started to talk, and I found myself sobbing and telling her that I didn't want to go back. I'll never forget the pain on her face and her gently telling me I could not stay. The way she let me know that she knew I was in a bad place that was painful for her to see me in, but that it was not something that she could take me out of. I woke up from my surgery with such a profound sense of grief and loneliness. As time passed, I felt a lot of regret about the way I spoke to her. I couldn't understand why I unloaded all that pain onto someone who should be in heaven and filled with peace and love, especially since all that pain was not something I was even aware of. The only thing I can think of is that, in that state of consciousness, you can only be your true self, and politeness and etiquette aren't really part of the equation, that uh, when you're communicating on such a deep level, that is. I can only hope that if I really was communicating with her, and I believe I was, that she can see that I'm in a good place now, and that speaking with her made me realize that what I was doing was not sustainable or healthy. And by the grace of God, my marriage has also found healing, and we're now in a place so wonderful we would never have believed it possible. Of course, my marriage was not something within my power to heal, but I am thankful that I did my part to make myself better, and my husband was also figuring himself out at the same time. And in my opinion, that can only have happened if we allowed God in to be with us while we did the work. The second dream was after my little sister lost her battle with her mental health. 
She was in her early 30s and had struggled all her life to come to terms with the hand that we had been dealt as kids born into dysfunction, abuse, drugs, and parents with mental health disorders. Her death was so, so painful and confusing because I thought she was doing better with her life and finding a peace that she had never had growing up. In my dream, I had gone to my church to investigate a water leak, and the dream just felt like a normal dream, the kind of dream that you wake up and realize your subconscious is trying to tell you something. I was with another member of the church, and when we walked in, we found three puddles of water. I have two sisters, so I've often wondered if the three puddles represent the three of us, the Holy Trinity, or possibly both. I said to the person with me that the problem was not something we could fix, and we needed to call another member of the church who knew more about where the water could be coming from, since we could not find a reason. We walked to the back of the church to head downstairs to the phone, and that's where my dream went something, uh, something from subconscious was sending myself to a feeling that the dream messages were coming from something outside myself. As we walked the stairs, a large group of adults started to come up from the downstairs. This is a dream, so the rules of logic are a little different, and in this dream there was an indoor pool downstairs that does not exist in reality. I noticed the adults were all wearing swimming clothes, and their hair was wet like they had just been swimming. I also started to notice that they all had special needs. They were all so happy and excited to have been swimming, and they were talking excitedly to the leader of the group. The leader was at the back of the group, and they all seemed to want to be around her and talk to her and tell her things, and it was a jumble of people in the stairway moving in the opposite of the direction I wanted to go. I looked at the leader of the group, and it was my sister. I could not get to her through the crowd of people, so we stood there staring at each other, her at the bottom of the stairs, me toward the top. I wanted so badly to hug her, but I couldn't get through. We had this wordless conversation with our eyes because we could not physically get close enough to talk over the loud group. She let me know she was okay, and that she was sorry, that she was working on healing, and that she could see things more clearly now. I could see in her eyes how surprised she was that I loved her as much as I did and that losing her hurt me so badly. The conversation had no words but was so full of information, and then the group left the church and was gone my sister with them. That dream makes absolutely no sense to me to this day. My sister did not work with people with disabilities and never expressed a desire to do so. The peace on her face when they were so excited to share things with her was not something I would have ever seen on her in a loud and chaotic moment like that. I don't know how much of the dream was real, how much was symbolism, but I do believe the dream was something I was meant to experience. It hasn't helped my uh, hurt any less, but I'll never forget the look of realization in her eyes when she saw my pain and realized she had such a big place in my heart. I decided to share these because they have so much meaning to me, and maybe someone who is in a dark place and hears these will know that they're loved and valued beyond measure, even if their mind will not allow them to really grasp onto that right now. One thing that's carried me through the cruelest moments in my own head is when I demand that I treat myself with as much kindness as I would anyone else. And what better reason to be nice to yourself than to accept that you should treat all of God's children kindly and that you are one of his kids. Sorry if that got a little too spiritual or religious. I'm the type of person who can't really take my creator out of the equation when I think of things like this. Thanks for letting me share this. Signed, Sarah. Sarah, that is powerful stuff. Um, it's not exactly what I was asking for when it came to dreams in, my, in our previous Fireside Frights, because I was asking for dreams that have, like, you've dreamed and then actually came true later on. But there is a lot of really powerful imagery in here. And I'm, I'm trying to think of some sort of interpretation for the dream about your sister and the special needs kids. And if she gave herself... Uh, let me no. Let me rephrase that. If she succumbed to her dark feelings and took her own life, I have to wonder if maybe this is just a small glimpse of heaven, and she's in a place now where she's helping people who, without possible, without uh, possibly having others to um, be with them, 
would be depressed. People with special needs, I'd imagine, uh, could could be very uh, very susceptible to dark thoughts because I, I you know that life is going to be a struggle for them even more so than for for uh, those of us who don't have special needs. And maybe that's uh, maybe that's her way of relieving their pain, their dark thoughts. Although you're not going to have pain and dark thoughts in heaven, but perhaps God put her in that place to allow her to kind of fill that role, I guess. It's a stretch. Uh, I know it is, but uh, that's the only thing I could think of. Um, the three the three puddles could very well be you and, and, your, and your sisters. And I don't, I don't know that that part uh, doesn't really have anything to do for me. But just the the image of your of your sister taking care of the special needs people, um, she's giving of herself. Maybe that's it. Maybe that, this is just coming up coming to me now. But some people say suicide is one of the the most selfish things that you can do. Now, I'm not going to get in get into that here. But just assuming for a moment that that's true, then on the other side maybe she's in a position where she's doing the most unselfish thing that she can do. And that would be giving all of herself to help others. Just an idea. Anyway, thank you very much for sending that to me, Sarah. I really appreciate it. This next story comes from Tina. I want to share an experience I've had with what I can only describe as a thought form. When I was turning 13, my parents allowed me to have a sleepover with a few of my friends. It was the one and only time I was allowed this privilege, for reasons that, I, that uh, will soon become obvious. I've always had a special affinity for Halloween and all things spooky. Planning my party for the weekend before Halloween was almost a given, even though my actual birthday was not until November. Well, you and I, Tina, have something in common right there. My birthday is November 1st, the day after Halloween, so I get it. Uh, anyway, she continues. I put a lot of thought into the food, the drinks, and activities for the night, especially my own completely fictitious This House is Haunted story. Our property was on a large lot with two outbuildings as well as fruit trees, a large garden area, and a fence draped with grapevines that looked quite dead in the fall once the grapes were harvested. The barren look of the trees and vines made a perfect backdrop for the tale I wove. Once all my friends had assembled, the festivities began on the back patio. Over drinks and snacks, I began to tell bits of the story. The larger of the outbuildings had admittedly fallen into some disrepair as it was only used for storage and honestly it looked like a perfect home for a ghost. We always thought it was originally built as a mother-in-law's cottage, so I explained in great detail how the previous owner had banished his mother-in-law to the little house. In her old age, she had become too unpredictable and mean to be in close quarters with the family's children, and the father had locked her in there. Over time, she became quite frail and eventually died. The father, fearing that he would be charged with neglect, removed the floorboards and buried her beneath to hide his guilt. For effect, I took my group of friends out to the door of the building and pretended to be scared to go in myself. I dared one of them to go in and look at the closet floor. I knew one of them would inevitably go in, see the boards my dad had replaced due to water damage from the leaking roof, and confirm that newer boards were there. The first step of my planned story was a success. After my friend came rushing back out the building screaming, I saw it! The floor has been torn up! She's really in there! <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm picturing this in my head, this is awesome. Okay, so the friend comes out screaming that the floor has been torn up, she's really in there. Uh, I knew I could continue to lead them to believe in my haunted tale. As night fell, I continued to add to the story. Our house had a unique design, as it had started as a simple one-bedroom frame house and had been added onto several times. Each addition, occurred different, uh, each addition occurred in a different era, with distinctively different building materials. As a result, the windows and trim in different rooms varied from six-pane, then single-pane wooden frames, then finally modern aluminum-framed picture windows. Walking through the rooms, I pointed out the changing materials and styles, noting that the, cha uh, that the changes were done to confuse the old lady's spirit and keep her away from the family who built the additions. By this time, I was scaring myself a little, even though I knew none of what I was saying was true. By 8 o'clock, we were all on edge, and I made sure all the curtains were closed. 
I told my friends that it was imperative, yes, I was that kid who liked to use such words, that no one open the curtains or peek out as the spirit liked to peer in at night. Problem was, I was more scared than anyone else there. After playing around with a homemade spirit board, we were so freaked out that we could almost see things coming out the corners from the shadows, and every pop and crack from the settling old house was amplified and ominous. By 9 o'clock, my parents had been in a fierce and uncharacteristic argument on the phone that ended with my friend's parents being called to pick them up. It was a great relief to all of them. They were terrified by the thought of staying the rest of the night, but none of them would have asked to leave. My mother then loaded me, my sisters, and the family dog into her car and drove us to her friend's house in the city. Later that night, my dad came home to an empty house and tore the place apart in a rage. We returned a couple days later to undo the destruction my dad caused that night and went on to live there several more years before my parents sold the house to another family. I began having night terrors and episodes of sleep paralysis after we, after we returned home that still affect me even today. Coincidentally, I grew up to marry the new owner's son and had to return to that house many times. They never had any issues with the house, but the dark spirit I spoke into being followed me for a long time. I still love Halloween, scary stories, and all things paranormal. I do not, however, speak often about this incident or the havoc that it wreaked. Tonight I hope to banish it forever, finally putting to rest whatever I created. May it never harm anyone again." What an amazing tale, Tina. That is incredible. And you know, you, you may have been, you know, creating that dark spirit in your mind, but you said that you did play with a, uh, a homemade uh, Ouija board. You didn't call it a Ouija board, but a uh, spirit board. You, uh, pl you played with one of those. Even if it is homemade, still, you're inviting spirits to come in. Even if you're playing around, and I don't really mean it, if you're saying the words and you're using a spirit board like that, it's an invitation. So it very well could be that um, playing with that, that spirit, a, a spirit did come through and decided to take on the presence of that dark spirit that you made up. You never know. Uh, so that, that's why I uh, that's why I tell people you know what be very careful when it comes to using spirit boards, Ouija boards, stuff like that, doing seances because you you are inviting the dark side to come in. And we're not talking Darth Vader. So anyway, th great story by the way. That that would make a great short film. Uh, this one comes from uh, Janaira. Hello again, Darren. I was so excited to hear you read my story. It was amazing to hear it being narrated the way you did it. Thank you so much. Now, last time I left off by telling you about when I was a little, when I was little, and had overheard my mom talking with my uncle, who at that moment had voluntarily let an entity into him to communicate with my mom. I'm not 100% sure how or when I was blessed. My mom had told me when I was growing up about it, saying that I had a guardian angel and um, as I grew up, I continued to have incidents and I started to believe she was right. Since later on in life, it, uh, it actually let itself known. Growing up in the early 80s, I was one of many children who fell, who fell through the cracks of the Children and Family Services system in New York, as well as around the country. Growing up, I'd get hit by my stepfather for no real reason, just because he wanted to. On those days, I'd wake up and look at my hand. If they looked slightly cold and all my veins showed, then I knew I was going to have a bad day. I knew it sounded strange, but I promise you that I started this habit at eight years old and it never failed me. If my hands were clear, I knew I'd be good. Not a real power, but it worked for me. Once when I was eight, I saw my first ghost ever. The lady next door was my mom's friend, and my mom would bring me over to spend some time with her. According to my mom, she was a really nice lady, but lonely. For the privacy of the family, let's call her Mary. Well, we lived at 1151 Elder Avenue in the Bronx, on the third floor. But one day, Mary was alone and decided to sit at the top of the stairs of the outside hallway. As she was sitting down, she had been drinking, so she was a little off balance. Mary must have either dozed off or passed out drunk, but she ended up falling down the stairs and broke her neck. The strangest thing I remember my mom telling me is that, that Mary was wearing funeral clothes when this happened. 
Turned out Mary was dying from lung cancer, and she had tried on the outfit to make sure that it would fit for when the day finally did come. But fate had other plans. A couple days later, we had a funeral and a wake. Once we were done with that, I remember going into her apartment to clean it out with my mom. It was pretty empty. Somebody had come and cleaned out most of it, most likely family. We made our way into her room, and I remember my mom picking up an Easter basket filled with pennies, lots and lots of pennies. She handed it to me. Here, look, you can sit and count all these pennies. Wouldn't that be fun? It was a lot of spare change, so I gladly took the basket and asked if we could go home, which was right next door, so she couldn't say no. That night, after dinner, I went to my room. My brother was on his bed reading a comic book. I grabbed the basket and sat on my bed counting pennies. Not long after that, it was time for bed. The floorboards in our room were made of wood, and when someone walked, they would creak. It must have been sometime around 2 a.m. when my brother woke me up. Hey, hey, wake up, do you hear that? Hear what? I groaned as I rubbed my eyes half asleep. Then, all of a sudden, creak. We both laid down quick and covered our heads with our blankets from head to toe. We could hear the floorboard creak some more, but we knew we were alone in the room, or so we thought. The next night, my brother was asleep and the creaking started. I didn't dare get off the bed, but the creaking was getting closer, so I took my chance and ran out of the room. My mom asked me what was wrong. I told her, I can't sleep. My floorboards keep creaking. I'm scared. What if it's the lady who died? Mary? What if she wants her pennies back? What if she's mad because I took them? My mom gave me a look of assurance. She went and checked, and nothing. She closed the door, but as she walked away, the door opened. She slowly walked back and shut the door for a second time, but this time she put on the lock. I was at the kitchen table, staring down the hall, scared. She was already halfway to the kitchen when the door opened, but this time, as she was walking towards the door, someone or something walked through her. I was staring at the hallway and saw the ghost. It stood in the entryway, and even though it was slightly blurred, I could make out the figure. It was the next-door neighbor. As she stood there, she just waved at me and then headed to the door. Mom! Mom! She's here! Mom! She's going out the door! Mom! But of course she missed her and didn't see anything. Mom! She would waved at me! I saw! I'm, I'm giving back her pennies! I don't want them! I don't want her to come back! My mom was looking at me with a small smile. Well, if she was here, then she just said goodbye. You did say she went through the door, correct? Yes, she did. This was the one experience I, I, had <clears throat> I have with seeing a ghost, but it wasn't my only encounter with ghosts or entities. The next day, sure enough, I took the basket of pennies back, and I left them in the now empty apartment. That was the last I saw of her. Now as an adult, I really think she just wanted to say goodbye. Well, I think you're probably uh, better off either way, whether or not she just wanted to say goodbye or wanted her pennies back. Uh, Shanaira, I think it's probably best you just take the pennies back. <laughs> better safe than sorry, right? Okay, this, <clears throat> excuse me, this next story comes from Velma. Hi Darren, I'm listening to your stories on angels. This is my pastor's testimony of his angel contact. Where we live, there is a single mountain called Mount Taranarki. Taranarki. I think that's how you say it. Anyway, there's a small ski field on the slopes of this mountain. While my pastor loves surfing and snowboarding, he's a very active man. He was snowboarding on this ski field and went to, uh, too far to one side and slipped over the edge of the field. He managed to stop before the cliff's edge, but every time he tried to get back up to the slopes, he kept getting closer to the edge. Well, he was starting to get really worried and started praying. When this stranger walked past him, held out his hand, and pulled him up from the edge. The pastor started taking off his board and then looked up to thank the man for his help. But the man was gone. The ski field is not big. It has no trees or anything to obscure your view, but this man had completely vanished. He swears it was an angel, and the Lord sends them when we are in need. Well, I'm not going to argue with your pastor. I believe in angels, and uh, they, uh, I've had my, my uh, experiences with them as well. At least I think I have. So, yeah. Uh, this next one comes from Panda. 
I know you're all now wondering, what's his angel story? What's his angel story? Okay, it's it's nothing too major. It's just I truly believe that it was it, it was maybe not even an angel, but God sent somebody my way to help me. It's just I had some car trouble once um, with a flat tire, and I am terrible with that kind of stuff. And I have a bad back; I can't reach down to do it or whatever. But um, as for I was. I was. I called my wife and asked her, say, hey, what, what can we do? And she didn't have her car with her, so she couldn't come and pick me up. And uh, I was just about to call a tow service when these two big black gentlemen came up and uh, started saying, hey, you need some help, or we're here to help you. And so they they took care of me and um, they made sure that I was that uh, everything was done, that the, the new tire was on. Um, and so then I started talking to them and it turns out they were a couple of, a couple of guys on a ministry trip, if I remember correctly. Anyway, they had nowhere to stay the night. So I gave them enough cash to uh, get them a hotel for the night and they were just so, so thankful. And so, um, like I said, I don't think it was necessarily angels. I think what it was is God knew that they needed a place to stay and didn't have the money to do it. And I needed somebody to help me with my car and I didn't know how to do it. And God brought the two of us together, um, or the three of us together, because there was two of them. But brought us all together in order to uh, take care of our needs. So that that's the that's the story. So, okay, moving on. This one comes from um, I, I think her name is Amanda, but she calls herself Panda, which I think is just the cutest thing ever. Uh, here she says, "Hey Darren, I have two shadow person stories to share for Fireside Frights. The story happened about six years ago when my husband and I were visiting his late grandmother's house." She had passed away a couple weeks before, and my husband was helping to fix up the house so it could be put on the market. We worked on the house all day and decided to spend the night there to get an early start the next morning. We went to bed around midnight. Sometime later, I woke up. It was still dark, but there was some muted light coming in through the window on my side of the room. I was laying on my side, facing my husband with my back to the window. The room felt weird, like someone was watching me. I nervously started to look around the room. As I looked up over my husband's shoulder, I saw a shadow standing over him. It seemed to be bending down, looking at my husband. I should have been terrified, but I only felt calm. I didn't feel threatened by this entity. I just calmly snuggled into my pillow, closed my eyes, and went back to sleep. I woke up in the morning very freaked out. I'm no stranger to shadow person stories. It really bothered me that I had come face to face with a shadow person and just went back to sleep. I should have been afraid for myself and my husband. I should have looked around the room for others. I should have prayed. There were a number of other things that I could or should have done instead of going to sleep. I rushed my husband to finish up what he was doing so we could pack up and go home. Not until we were on our way home did I relax enough to tell my husband about the experience. I don't know what the shadow person wanted. Since that experience, I've seen another shadow person, and that time I was terrified. Part of me wonders if perhaps this was my husband's grandma coming to say goodbye to him, and that's why I wasn't afraid. Maybe this was just sleep paralysis. But I've had that before, and the experience was a lot different than this. I'll never know for sure. Here's the second story. This incident happened about three years ago. I was going to pick up a case of beer from a friend's place for our softball team. Each week, somebody else brings beer for after the game, but this week, the appointed person forgot. My husband had left a case at a friend's house nearby, so I went to go get it. When I arrived at the house, it was completely dark, and our friends weren't there. I know the door code, so I went in through the kitchen door. As I came in the door, I flicked on the light. The kitchen light seeped into the adjacent dining room that was straight ahead. I looked up and, standing behind the dining room table, stood a large shadow person. I couldn't make out any features, just a person standing there. It startled me and I stood there, terrified. I only saw it for a few seconds before it disappeared. I stood there for a long time, trying to figure out what I should do. The shadow person had stood between me and where I needed to go. The light switch I needed to turn on next was right behind where the shadow person had stood. I needed to walk through the dark living room to get to that light switch. I seriously considered going back to the ball diamond without the beer, but that would have caused a lot of questions. 
I gathered my courage and decided to keep going and get the beer. It wasn't going to be... I wasn't going to be easy prey, though. I left my shoes on and moved through the house as quickly as I could. Entering the living room was the hardest part for me. I had to walk through the semi-darkness to the light switch. What if the shadow person was still in that room? I peeked in, and when I saw no shadow person, I ran across the room to the switch. I went to the basement, cold storage, picked up the beer, and got out of there. I've been to this house many times before, and slept there on multiple occasions. It always felt a bit off to me, but nowhere near the feelings I had in an actual haunted house. I figured the house felt weird because of the conflict and negativity in my friend's relationship. They need to learn to communicate. It's so frustrating to watch. Now I think that there's something more to the feel of the house and possibly the conflict between my friends. I avoid going to this house now. It's not just the shadow figure, though. After that happened, any time I would sleep at their place, I would wake up in the night in a full-blown panic attack. After this happened a few times, I stopped sleeping there. I tried to do a house cleansing as well, but I kept getting unfocused and messing up my words. At that point, I decided that I was not getting more involved with this energy and I was going to remove myself from the situation. I worry about my friends who live there, but one just seems indifferent. The other wouldn't even believe in the supernatural if it walked up, slapped him in the face, and said, hey, I'm a spirit. So there's not much more to be done about this situation. Thanks for reading my stories, Darren. I promise to send you more. So much weird stuff has happened in my life, and it's nice to share it with others who don't think that I'm strange. Well, actually, Panda, we do think you're strange, but that's also why you're loved and accepted here. <laughs> so not to worry. Um, yeah, it sounds like that that house does definitely need to be cleansed, um, whether it be from shadow people or or just the, the negativity from the relationship, or maybe it's the house that's causing that ne negativity. You might actually have something about something there. So if uh, you weren't able to stay focused, find somebody that can. Um, uh, me, obviously, from my from my religion, you know, I would be going to a pastor or something and saying, hey, we need somebody to bless this house and, you know, anoint it with oil or something along those lines. But yeah, it definitely needs to be cleansed. This next story comes from Savannah. This is my true story. I call this story Trevor. I was participating in a haunting tour at Bartonville Insane Asylum. It was September of 2015. Now, many of you may know that this is one of Illinois' most haunted places. During this tour, I had a spirit following me. I'll get to that in a minute. One of the other people in the tour had an EVP, and we actually got to hear Zeller, which he is the owner of the asylum. He said my name, and I thought that was cool. I witnessed so many paranormal activities. There was this spirit that kept calling me his sweetheart. I asked what his name was, and he said, Trevor. I asked if he was a passerby or if he used to be a patient there. He said passerby. Well, Trevor kept following me around. Didn't think too much of it at the time, but then I kept noticing through the tour that my ex was constantly in pain, and every time we put the K2 meter near him, it was going off. Little did we know that it was Trevor causing her pain. So me and my ex continued walking around with the tour, and she doubled up in pain again, and my K2 meter was going off like crazy. He apparently didn't like my ex, which now I know why he didn't like her. So he followed me all night, and I finally I said, hey, Trevor, want to take a pic with your sweetheart? And as you can see in the photo, that she actually sends me a photo here. Unfortunately, I lost it in the computer crash, but um, the photo does have Savannah standing there, and there is this orb right next to her. That's the photo that she was referring to. Um, she says that it didn't stop there. Little did she know, um, little did I know that he was going to follow me home. So after the tour had finished, I stepped outside and said, whatever dwells here stays here. I said it three times. Little did I know that Trevor was, was going to follow me anyway. So me and my ex got into the car. We pulled out of the parking space, and strange things kept happening in the car, like my charger kept falling out of the cigarette lighter port, and then my iPhone that was no longer activated was ringing. And I won't lie, I was really shaking because, well, the phone doesn't work because it's not activated, and now it's ringing? So I nervously picked up the phone, looked at it, and said, you may answer. And there was a series of random numbers with a ghost face. My ex took the phone and answered, and was, it was nothing but white noise. She passed the phone to me, and I said, hello, 
it was still a white noise. So I hung up and said, oh well, now I know who, now I know who it is, it's Trevor. So my ex decided to say something that she shouldn't have said. And he threw my paperwork all over the back seat and tried to drain my ex's energy whilst she was driving. I told her to turn the car around and go back so we, we can take Trevor home where he came from. We almost got into several wrecks that night, all because of her basically taunting Trevor. Her energy was declining so fast I took my pentagram off my neck and placed it in her hand and told Trevor to knock it off. Finally we get back and I fling open the door so fast and I tell him to get the hell out of my car. Now mind you, everybody in the asylum knew of Trevor following me while I was there, and when I came back they said, you're back. I said, I had to drop off an unwanted guest. They said, let me guess, Trevor. I said yes. It was a very interesting night. Sadly, the Bartonville Insane Asylum has been torn down since. This one comes from Kelly, and uh, she actually titled it. It's called Quarters from Heaven. Since I was a girl, I have heard about dead family members leaving pennies, so to let us living know we are being thought of. I've always wondered if you could ever see them fall or even hear them fall. Well, I know, I now know, you can. Last summer, I went and spent an hour with a psychic. Among lots of things we talked about, she mentioned that the quarters I had been finding throughout the house were from my grandmother. I said I had been finding them for about a year and was thrilled to know that they were from her. Many months later, I was in the car with my granddaughters, and we were waiting for my son to come back from the house. My oldest granddaughter and I were discussing the importance of finishing her French toast sticks. I had just given her back a stick, saying that I'm not going to eat mine if she didn't eat hers. I turned around and focused on if my son had left the house yet, when I heard something hit by me. I turned around, thinking the child had thrown a French toast stick at me. She said no. Not totally believing her, I turned my eyes to where I heard the sound. My heart leapt as I spied a shiny quarter laying on the driver's seat. I was shocked, amazed, and thrilled. Yes, you can hear the coins when they hit. Well, you can't always hear them, Kelly. And the reason I say that is I had a coin experience happen to me. I'd completely forgotten about it until I read your story. But Kathy Cresshall over at hauntedrockford.com, she had a, a small presentation um, about a year or so ago, maybe a little bit more, and I volunteered to read a couple of stories for her while, while we were there. Well, once the whole thing was over, um, it was just her and I talking, and we were just packing up, ready to go, and suddenly she looked down and there was a quarter. We had both been in that area for a while, and I have a tendency to look down to the floor a lot. I just do that. I did not see that quarter there before. Nobody passed by to drop a quarter, but suddenly there it was between the two of us right next to the wall. So now I'm personally, I'm thinking, okay, I just missed it. You know, all right, maybe, all right, may, maybe it was dropped by somebody else, but Kathy's really turned, really tuned into the spirit world. And she says that it actually happens at this location. It, it was, oh, by the way, it was the Tinker Swiss Cottage that this took place in, in the, in the barn there. And there's a one specific entity, which I cannot remember the name of, but I think it was, a, I think it's a little boy, uh, or, no, I take it back. One, one, one of the former workers of the, of the uh, Tinker Swiss Cottage. Anyway, it doesn't matter, but regardless, there is an actual spirit there that is known to, once in a while, drop coin. And she says that's where it came from. So, and we had, we did not hear it drop. So that's why I say that. Okay, this next one comes to us um, anonymously. Uh, I do know the person's name, but they asked me to keep them anonymous. Uh, they said, Hi Darren, I was born and raised in the South Bay of Los Angeles. I lived on the same street for the majority of my adolescence and adult life in two separate homes. My family and I first lived in a tiny two-bedroom apartment, having to share a room with my parents and two sisters, while my uncles shared the other room and my aunt was in the living room. As long as I can remember, the first home we lived in was always really scary and dark. My friends would always tease me and my sisters about our apartment complex being haunted. The following scary events started when I was around six. The neighborhood we lived in was a Hispanic community, and it was a pretty dangerous gang area. Shootings were a nightly occurrence, and uh, it wasn't out of the norm to see a dead body being picked up on the way to school. Next door to my building was a huge parking lot where most of the gang activity took place, if I remember correctly. There was at least three murders back there. Anyway, I was really close to my aunt. 
my family would leave to the store and I'd be allowed to stay home with her. We'd watch movies together till they came home, and one night while we were watching TV, my uncle's room door slammed shut a few times, scaring the crap out of us. My aunt was a really tough lady. She kept a gun under her bed. She quickly got it and ran towards the room. With guns aimed, she opened the door quickly, turned to me, and said calmly, let's go to the store. Mind you, it was eight at night, and there'd been a shooting earlier that night, but I didn't think anything of it at the moment. By the time we got back, my parents were home. I overheard my auntie speaking to my mom about it, my mom telling her that she's crazy, my dad making fun of her. I still don't know what she saw, but she saw something. About a week later, again, I was at home with her while my family was out. I walked into the room to get something when I noticed the TV was on. When I went to turn it off, I noticed something that I will never forget. On the TV screen, the words, touch screen were flashing. This was the early 90s. The TV we had was probably 20 inches with two dials, no remote, no technology at all. I placed my hand on the screen and it went haywire for a few seconds and then back to normal. Still, I didn't think anything of it. I was so young. A few weeks later, my elementary school class was going on a field trip to somewhere that I really can't remember, but it was something to do with hiking. My parents said no because some kid from my school had disappeared during a field trip to the same place, they said. I don't know if that really ever happened. I cried but had to accept it because when they said no, they meant we have no money. That night I cried myself to sleep. I had a weird dream that the TV was on. When I got up to turn it off, I see a news report and footage of a kid crying, walking with a dog. I'm guessing this was the lost kid my parents were talking about. It scared me awake, and that's when the most terrifying thing happened to me and would change my life forever. I felt someone hitting me really hard on my legs repeatedly. When I tried to get up to see what was there, there was an old lady crouching on the floor. When she saw me, she swung a punch to my face but missed and hit me in the legs over and over till my cries woke my sister up and then it was gone. To this day, I'm still unsure if that was just a nightmare or if it really happened. I'm 35 now and I'm still scared of the dark, and I always sleep in the fetal position because of this. Our landlord was this really nice old man named Raymond. He had a really deep voice. He was aware of all the gang activity in the lot next to my home and said that he'd put up a fence since the alley that separated the lot from us was used as a getaway route when the cops pulled up. Once they knocked over my 80-year-old neighbor while trying to get away, she banged her head and ended up with six staples. One night, my sister was getting some water. It had to be about 9 p.m. because my parents were watching the news, but she heard something at the back door. When she looked out, she saw Raymond. He signaled for her to come out, and when she did, she asked, why are you out here so late? He said, come out and help me. My sister quickly said no and turned back inside when something grabbed her ankle. I remember the screaming, my dad and uncles getting up, and even the gangsters in the lot came running towards our door, but there was nothing there. They searched the area, but nothing. My sister kept yelling, that was not Raymond, over and over again. That really messed her up. Even today, she's 38 years old and refuses to speak about that night. There was always something weird going on in our apartment but also the other two units. My neighbors complained to my dad once, saying that I should not be allowed to be outside after midnight bouncing my basketball. I never did that. Another neighbor said that she heard my auntie crying by their window. She denied that, that ever happened. As I got older, things started to change, and the activity settled a bit. But one night, a week before we would be moving across the street to a way bigger home, a two-floor, three-bathroom, three-bedroom townhome, no more sharing a room with our parents. We still had to share it with my sisters, though. Uh. Anyway, I was packing my few belongings in our room when the lights began to flicker. When I turned around, I got a glimpse of a shadow, and then the box with my belongings got smacked to the floor. I mean, literally smacked. I heard the smacking sound of a hand making contact. I felt the wind of the smack being thrown. I ran out crying. No one believed me, either. We moved to our new home in 1998, and within the first six months of being there, my mother's health began to get bad. My mom's always been a sickly lady. She's diabetic, suffers from high blood pressure, a few other things. She began having trouble breathing, and one night she had to be rushed to the hospital. Turns out her kidneys were failing. 
She began dialysis immediately and was forced into early retirement. She was only 45 at the time. Her health was so bad, she prepared us for her death. These were hard and sad times. Our neighbor was a former gang member from the same neighborhood that we lived in, named Eddie. A really nice guy with an awesome Monte Carlo with great sounds and a hydraulic system was badass. He let me hit the switches a few times. Anyway, while my mom was going through her health issues, she began telling my dad and uncles, by then my auntie had moved out, that her bedroom door was opening and closing by itself. She caught glimpses of someone sitting next to her and that she was having dreams of her mother, who had passed in 1980, telling her, I'll let you know when it's time to go, and to explain to us that she'd have to leave but we would see each other again. These were really bad and sad times. This one night my mom came into our room and kissed us all. I was the youngest and the only boy. I think she was the most worried about me because of this. She didn't realize that I was awake. She was sobbing, saying not to be scared of her when she left because that was just her watching over me and to be ready to become a man because my dad would need my help. I cried but didn't reply. She must have felt so ill. My dad said that he heard my mom praying. She said, God, I'm ready to go if it's my time, but please let me watch over my kids and don't let them be scared of me or forget me. My dad says he was expecting to wake up to find my mom dead, but she made it through the night. My neighbor Eddie did not see the morning, though. He was getting gas at a station nearby when someone drove up and shot four times. He tried to drive himself to the hospital but didn't make it. He left two boys behind, four and two, and an unborn daughter. My mom says that she felt like it was her time to go that night, but when she started praying, she felt like her accepting her death and her final wish of being able to watch over us changed God's mind and decided to spare her and took Eddie instead. It still sucked. We were heartbroken that he had passed, especially being murdered. I miss Eddie. A few months after we moved into our new home, things started to get a bit odd. We all started getting used to the new routine of my mother's dialysis treatment, which was four hours a day, three times a week. She'd be home by the time my sisters and I would get home from school. The treatment was hard on her. Her attitude changed a lot. She was always a really sweet and positive lady. My friends all love her, but that treatment was horrible on her, and I can't blame her. She'd still cook for us, but she was slow. We tried as much to help her, but she'd get annoyed, kick us out of the kitchen. I'd hear her whisper to my uncle Manny, her younger brother that lived with us, that she'd seen Eddie, our deceased neighbor, pass by the window when she was cooking, that she could smell the cologne that he used to wear when she would come home for her treatment and would be alone for about an hour until we got home. Eddie was about 26 when he was murdered. He was at least 5 foot 10, Hispanic, really light-skinned and slim, always had a smile on his face. He'd work on his Monte Carlo in the back of our building and would show me what was on a car. To this day, I still work in the automotive business because of him. Anyway, I hate to get personal about his life, but he had a very abusive wife. She'd hit him, throw things at him, always cursing at him, so it was no surprise that his death brought lots of shame and guilt to her life. I'm sure she was already a drug addict, but she hit rock bottom after he departed. Her two kids were always dirty and hungry. My mom would feed them and wash their clothes. One day in September of 98, she was having a bad trip on whatever drug she had used that she tried attacking me when I was coming out of my door. I was 12. I had no choice but to body slam her fragile butt. She lay there crying until my mom came out to help her up. She looked like she was all ready to kill my mom when I told her, you touch my mom, one of us is going to die today. I meant it too. She went inside and went into labor. Oh yeah, she was prego. We didn't know that especially not me. Needless to say, I felt horrible. The ambulance came and took her and her newborn daughter away, but the kids were left behind. I was friends with Eddie's younger brother, Wally. He was 18 and a full-fledged gang member. My parents would tell me to stay away from him, but I was at that age where you couldn't tell me anything. I called him and he and his brother came for the two boys. In November, a few days before my 13th birthday, my then-girlfriend invited me to, let's just say, have a sleepover of sorts. Her parents were out of town, and her 18-year-old sister had no dams to give about who came over. It was past 11 p.m. when I snuck out of the house. My girlfriend lived two streets up from me, uh, on what was considered the most dangerous street in the neighborhood. 
I prepared myself mentally and physically for the walk because I was literally walking into a war zone. As I slowly closed my front door, I clearly heard, don't do it. I jumped because it was Eddie's voice. I stood there frozen for a few seconds and then made my way out quietly. As I began the short walk, an older Chevy passed me up and I clearly heard, go home. It was Eddie again. This time I freaked out, ran back to my house, and as I ran into the driveway, I hear, get your ass home. It was Eddie again. I ran inside, slammed the door. I didn't care if my parents heard me or not. When I laid down, I heard it. Gunshots. About 20 of them. I found out the next morning that a good friend of mine was shot and killed, and another friend was wounded and left paralyzed from the waist down. If it wasn't for Eddie, I surely would have been hit or worse. I know I didn't imagine it. These are all things Eddie would say to me. He saved me. In early February 1999, that woman came home, clean or so she seemed. Her daughter tested positive for drugs. The three children were taken away, but she regained custody after getting clean. She kept a low profile and stayed away from us, especially me. One night I was outside fixing my lowrider bike that I was very proud of when this woman comes outside in a low voice and says, there he is. Three older men, which I had never seen before, try attacking me. Using the new bike chain I was attempting to replace, I swung it hitting them all repeatedly. One pulled a knife out. I pick up nearly every empty bottle of WD-40 off the floor. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. And all three of these cowards cover themselves up like a mountain was falling on top of them. They ran off. Mind you, I was 13, 5 foot 2, maybe 112 soaking wet. These guys were probably in their 30s. I still don't know who they were. One ran off, but something I'll never forget. Who the blank is that tall ass white boy with that bat? Eddie was Mexican, but he was very light skinned and he loved baseball. From what his brother told me, he was buried with a baseball bat. My other neighbor heard the commotion outside and called the cops. This woman barricaded her son in her home and threatened to kill her children. There was a two-hour hostage negotiation. One of my really strange and recluse neighbors calmly told my mom, those children are okay. Their daddy is with them. He's in the room with them. I'll never forget the look in my mom's face when she told my dad, she doesn't know Eddie died, huh? My dad said I doubt it. She never comes out of her house and probably doesn't have a phone. The police finally got her to surrender. That was the last time we had heard or felt Eddie. The kids were adopted by their oldest uncle. They're all very successful now, and I see the baby girl, which is now 24, and lives close to my home. She looks just like her father. It's almost eerie. She asked me if I remember him. I say, yes, he was awesome. You have his smile, and he loved all three of you and stayed around for you. She said, I think he still is, and I'm sure he is. I'm 35 now, single, and I live in a very quiet and safe coastal town in the South Bay of Los Angeles. Not too far away from the neighborhood I grew up in, but far enough. I have a five-year-old daughter, and I regularly go on walks with her on the weekends when she comes over. I seen Eddie's daughter last Saturday while on our walk. We waved at each other. I thought to myself, now I know why you couldn't leave. That night I had a dream that he passed by in his badass Monte Carlo and said, Go home. With a big smile on his face, I yelled, I'm a grown-ass man now, Eddie. You go home. He responded, You're always going to be a little kid to me. I woke up, and I could smell his cologne. He's the reason why I'm sharing this story. He's still around. I miss Eddie. What a great story. Wow. And I've heard of angels being uh, being identified from like muggers, where they'll like they'll try to rob somebody, like an old lady or something, but they ran off because there was like two or three people, big guys behind the old lady, and they didn't want to take them on. But there wasn't actually anybody there, and now it looks like Eddie is kind of filling the role of an angel in that way, which is really cool. Um, Scott sent us this one. So some years ago, me and my girlfriend, now wife. We're driving in our little town that we grew up in, Burbank, Illinois, literally right outside Chicago, South Siders. We drove down a street near her house. We seen a light in the sky, 
too low to be aircraft or helicopter, even though Midway Airport was right there. This light seemed to stop abruptly and then start again, hover and then dart ahead and stop just as quick, not moving like any aircraft I've ever seen and far too low below the tree line at the park. We followed it into the next town, Bedford Park, down to a street that horseshoes, following back along the factories and manufacturers. It seemed to have seen us doing this because it increased its speed. Now we followed it until the light itself just disappeared between a small area of trees, in between a warehouse and a manufacturer, just disappeared, like if you turned off a flashlight in a dark room. This light was an orange-yellow color, like an old incandescent light but much brighter, and it went out with so and it went out with, without a trace left. This light still to this day is a sore topic of conversation for my bride. She will admit what she had seen, reluctantly, as she might be to address it. For some years now, we've been akin to several unexplained and paranormal experiences. Instances, some, until this day, just bring the shivers to me. We also witnessed the Tinley Park Triangles firsthand, but only in our town. I believe we're not alone in this universe, which also leads me to believe that there are more planes of existence. The one that we're used to is one of just many. I've seen things, too, of a supernatural feel, but they're more of for a different time and, well, that's a different story. I think I may be a sensitive, slightly attuned to things, but can't be explained by means of science. As I've gotten older, they may become, they've become less and less frequent, but maybe I'm just open-minded. Anyway, keep up the great work, keep the stories coming, and I'll definitely keep listening. God bless. Thanks, Scott. This one comes from Janine. My daughter's university is located in the Catskills, and it's about three and a half hours from my home. I've made this drive several times over the last two years and always make sure to use the bathroom before I leave, but this particular night I did not. I saw in the news a snowstorm was going to start around 7 a.m. with an expected accumulation of 10 to 15 inches. After seeing this, I called my daughter and told her that I was heading out so I would not get stuck in the storm. About two hours had passed being on the road. I suddenly had the urge to use the bathroom. I've always avoided truck stops or rest stops because of the negative events portrayed on television and in movies, but I could not hold it any longer. When I pulled into the parking area, there were eight 18-wheelers and four other cars. All seemed peaceful and quiet, so I decided I could run in and out without incident, but I was wrong. I entered the bathroom using the second stall, at which point the main bathroom door opened. At this point, I thought nothing of it, as I was just glad to relieve myself. I'm not sure why, but I looked down and saw a pair of large men's construction boots. I said, hey, mister, this is the ladies' room. No response. I was so angry, I thought this guy must be a pervert, and I opened my stall door and proceeded to kick in the door next to mine, and nothing. There was no one there. This freaked me out. I quickly washed my hands and walked without haste to my car. I started my car, and as I backed up, there stood an apparition of a man wearing those same boots I saw in the stall right next to mine. I was so scared, I drove off and didn't look back. It'll be the first and last time I stop at a truck stop. Hmm. Haunted rest areas. That would be an interesting topic for, a, for an episode. Although, right so far, I have only one story <laughs> that would be in that episode, and that's this one from Janine. Actually, I guess this is, a, this is a truck stop, actually, not even a rest stop, so. There are a lot of lot of creepy truck stop stories, That that's for sure. I've actually done episodes on that. You can just look for, just do a search for truck stop at weirddarkness.com. You'll, you'll actually find some of the, uh, the uh, truck stop nightmare stories. This next one comes from Tarian. Hello, Darren. I have a short story. Back in 2009, when I was alone one day, I just got home from work and I chose to relax, kick back, and watch a movie. So I grabbed everything I would, that I would need to watch my movie. I like to smoke some ganja while I relax, please don't judge. Now this is back when DVDs were popular, and I bought a movie called Black Swan. Now this is far from a scary movie, maybe a thriller, but no scary movie. So I closed my room door and again I was completely alone. I powered up my PS3, I popped in the disc and jumped in bed. Now the movie was really good and ran for an hour 48 minutes, so as the movie ended, the lights in my room began to flicker. Not my TV, 
not my PlayStation, just my bedroom lights. Then my room door swung open and hit the wall behind it. I looked at my joint and noped right out of there. I didn't even put my shoes on till I got in the car. I spent the next four hours in my car till I had to pick up my girlfriend at the time. She laughed at me, but that fear was real. There wasn't a soul in front or behind the door, just the living room. Empty as all get out. When we got home, I tried to find a scientific explanation, like maybe I didn't close it all the way or the power surge caused the AC unit to turn off, but well, how did the door open? That's my question. Anyway, thank you so much. Have a blessed day and thank you, my weirdo family. This next one comes from Callie. Hello, Darren. I'm a fairly new weirdo. I'm starting from the first episode. I have two stories to share with you. Thank you for mentioning first responders and military. I'm an EMT firefighter and my whole family are military and first responders. One is when my grandma passed away October 21st, 2009, and before she passed, she told me that I'll always protect you and be at your important events in your life. When my husband and I got married in 2019, on October 26th, right as my husband and I were getting ready, you could smell roses and baby powder, which was her scent of choice. My husband and I smiled and we knew she was there. Another time, my husband and I got into a bad argument when uh, he was working at a Target warehouse and we went to bed angry at each other, and the next morning my grandma pushed my husband down the porch and three feet into gravel. Since then, she's done stuff to drive him crazy. Thank you for all you do and keep the podcast going. I can't wait for the new episodes and this December I'll be 11 years clean from self-harming. Wow, Kelly, th first, congratulations, 11 years clean. That's amazing. Um, that's definitely inspiring. You should, uh, uh, you, should, you should be proud of that. And also a huge thank you for your service, uh, not just yours, but your family as well. You said that you're an EMT firefighter and that your whole family are military and first responders, so thank you to your entire family. And if your grandmother's lis uh, listening, um, hi. <laughs> Sounds like a lady you do not want to tick off. Um, this next one comes from Lori. Hi, Darren. The following is an original poem that I wrote about black-eyed children. I write all the time and usually let my friends read it. I've never shared anything on a larger scale like this. Nervous. I hope you like it and uh, you can use it for the podcast. Your friendly fellow weirdo signed, Lori. P.S. I love the podcast. All right, Lori. Well, let's give it a shot. It's called Don't Let Them In. All Hallows' Eve has come and passed, but you hear a tapping at your door. Upon inspection there, you find that three small children stand before. Don't let them in. A sweeping wind comes gusting by. The hair upon your neck stands straight. You feel the fear drip down your spine. Your sweating hands begin to shake. Something seems unnatural. Something's off about these kids. Every fiber of your being screams, but you can't tell just what it is. They tell you they've lost their way. They cannot find their home. Can they come in for a moment? Please, can they just use your phone? It's cordless. Please, just wait out here. I'll bring the phone to you. Their scowling faces indicate this simply will not do. You lock and bolt and chain your door. Retreat to find your phone. For the first time in a long time, you wish you weren't alone. You call the sheriff. Hello, yes, there are kids outside my door. Yeah, seems that there's some sort of prank. We have had this call before. Lock the door and go to bed. They'll be gone by morning. We don't think they're dangerous, but we'll put out a warning. Don't let them in. The night does not pass easy. The children in a rage shake doors and rattle windows, turn your home into a cage. Rays of dawn spill in your room like golden sweet relief, but commotion from across the street cuts your moment brief. Crime tape all around the house, lights of flashing blue. What happened to your neighbor, and could it have been you? No body found, but pools of crimson, footprints small and bare. When you refused them entry, they found welcome over there. She didn't heed the warning. She was such a gentle soul. She felt pity for these small, lost babes and pulled them in her home. Did she not get the awful feeling? Could she not sense that they were evil? 
Did something in her body warn? Something's wrong about these people? Then you realize what was wrong with them. It stopped you in your track. They looked like normal children, except their eyes were solid black. Don't let them in. That is really good, Lori. I don't know why you were nervous about sending that in. That is, that is really good. I would love to see somebody, like a, a musician, put music under that and make a song out of it. That would be a, a really creepy tune. Okay, one final story, and I always like to, to uh, end the evening on a long one. Um, but before I get into this, uh, please know that I am out of stories now. So, uh, uh, because, again, because of my computer crash, I lost just about everything. So if you have not heard your story uh, in Fireside Frights, and you have sent one in the past, then um, that probably means that your story was lost in my computer crash, and please send in your story again. All you got to do is go to WeirdDarkness.com and then click on Tell Your Story, and uh, you can follow the directions there to send in your story. I'm looking for true stories specifically, true stories that happen to you or someone you know, and uh, they can be paranormal, supernatural, um, extraterrestrial, um, a stalker story, anything dark, strange, mysterious, and scary, That's that would be fine, okay? So again, if you have a story, just go to WeirdDarkness.com and click on Tell Your Story. If you don't, well, then we won't have any Fireside Frights next, next month. Okay, our last story comes from Sarah, Scandinavia, summer 1992. My family and a couple of friends were winding down a summer backpacking trip on Ural Pass. We left Copenhagen and were headed back to Norway, where my mom and I lived at the time. She taught English overseas throughout my high school years. We had two compartments on the train one for my cousin, sister, and her boyfriend. They were between 19 and 25 years old. My mom, my friend from school, and I were in the other. My friend and I had both turned 15 that summer. My mom had dozed off. We were restless, so took a walk down the hall to the restroom. In the hall were seats that folded against the wall for overflowing seating when necessary. I pulled out a wall seat directly between my family's two rooms and waited for my friends to return from the restroom. The car we occupied was not full, which is how we lucked out with two compartments. It was a rare treat that summer. Suddenly, the door between cars opened and a man walked through. He was pretty tall, probably in his 40s, and was dressed from head to toe in light blue denim. There were no other people in sight. As he approached me, I noticed he was staggering. I attributed it to bumps on the train. As he walked by me, he leaned close to me and placed a hand against the wall. In the moment, I assumed he had lost his balance and was trying to steady himself. I smiled politely. Suddenly, he started yelling words that I didn't understand. He quickly switched to English, mumbling about something I was wearing and what did it say. He put his hands around my throat, lifted me up, and pushed me against the wall. I remembered the Save the Planet dog tags that I was wearing. They were a birthday gift from my sister. While he was strangling me, he grabbed the dog tags and kept shouting about war and did I understand what it meant, etc. I struggled and kicked, but I couldn't scream with, my, with uh, his hands around my throat. I remember wondering why my family, who were only just a few feet from me, weren't coming to help me. Just then, my friend came running down the hall, screaming to the man to stop. I think she may have hit his arm. Still, no one came. My friend slid open the door to our compartment and got my mom. I don't know what she told her, but when my mom came out, the man let go of me and ran down the hall to the next car. My mom called the conductor and told him what had happened. They found the man, threw him off the train at the next stop, somewhere in Sweden. Evidently, he had a history of getting drunk, boarding trains, and harassing people, especially Americans. He claimed to be a veteran of a war, but who knows. I stopped wearing those dog tags a few months later. No idea what happened to them and I had been excited to receive them, too. They were so me. Now I prefer clothing that doesn't touch my throat or pull on my neck in any way. I love colorful scarves, but it took me many years to be able to wear one without having an anxiety attack. I can be jumpy when strangers come into my personal space. I may never understand how a piece of costume jewelry provoked this man to attack me. San Diego, January or February 2004. I was a new mom living in a two-bedroom apartment a mile from San Diego State University. 
it was a bustling urban area. My then husband was enlisted in the Marines. I was a newlywed with a newborn, but all my neighbors were partying SDSU students. The back of our apartment had a typical San Diego dirt yard area with a patio off the living room. There was another patio area that appeared to be connected to the apartment prior to us living there. I sat beneath our daughter's window that could only be accessed from the outside. There were two floors above us. There were no patios or fire escape ladders between the floors. One night, I put our daughter to bed in her crib, which was in front of the room's one long window. It had vertical blinds. A few minutes later, I came back because I'd forgotten to close those blinds. When I reached for the rod to pull them closed, I saw someone looking back at me through the window. I ran from the room and opened the sliding door. I saw a young-looking man wearing a dark hoodie. I screamed that there was a man standing outside the baby's window. My husband quickly got his gun and ran outside. He saw the guy run off. Nothing ever came of it, but I will tell you this. The first time I watched the pilot episode of Supernatural, when Mary walks in and finds a man in a trench coat standing over Sam's crib, it gave me special chills. Who was that guy, and what did he want? We were on high alert for a while, worried that someone was trying to break in and or steal our baby. Rural Missouri, the late 70s. When I was an infant, my parents married. My dad adopted my older sister and me. We moved into the house where he'd lived with his late wife and two sons. My mom's sister lived with her husband and her two sons in a neighborhood a couple miles away. My uncle and my dad were work colleagues. They visited our house on a regular basis. My mom and her sister were on the phone back and forth making plans. I was in diapers, so I don't know their specific plans. My aunt and two cousins drove to our house, and when they got there, my aunt sent one of my cousins inside the house to tell everybody that they were here and that they were ready to go. From the front yard and driveway, there was a breezeway that led to an enormous deck that was connected uh, to the side of the house where we had a lot of family barbecues and get-togethers. When my cousin made it to the deck, he found my teenage stepbrother washing the deck with a garden hose. This was one of his regular chores. He told my cousin that he was the only one home and had no idea what we were talking about. My cousin went back to the car and told my aunt what, st what the stepbrother had said. Confused, my aunt made the short drive back to her house, and when she walked in, the phone was ringing. It was my mom, calling to ask what the holdup was. She's ready to go. My aunt told her that my stepbrother said nobody was home. My mom said that's obviously not right and had no idea what was going on but to please come back. In the meantime, my mom went to ask my stepbrother why he had told my cousin no one was home when she had spoken to him only a few minutes prior and that she had not left the house. But when she walked out to the deck, my stepbrother was nowhere to be found, and the deck was bone dry. There was not enough time for him to put away the garden hose or adequate time for the deck to dry off in the five minutes it took my aunt to drive home. When my stepbrother was asked about the story, he said it never happened, that he never talked to my cousin because he was not home at the time. A couple side notes. No one has ever been able to explain the story, but there are speculations. Some family members believe my stepbrother was the catalyst. He was in middle school. His mother died suddenly. A year later, his dad remarried and moves in, moves in a stepmom and two little sisters, and his older brother is headed off to college. We've all wondered if this unhappiness stirred up some weirdness. Maybe my stepbrother had a doppelganger. Most of my family felt that the house was haunted. Before my parents met, my dad was married with two sons, as I mentioned. His wife died of an aneurysm on that deck the day I was born. It wasn't until I was eight or nine years old that I learned I was not his biological child. I was 16 when my mom told me this story. My parents were set up by the same aunt that I had mentioned earlier. He was newly widowed with two teenage sons and my mom was divorced with two young children. When my dad learned that I had been born the day that his wife died, he believed that she had been reincarnated in me. I've never felt any connection to the woman, but I feel that it may have influenced his perspective. After all, he married my mother, adopted my sister and me, we were the Midwest's answer to the Brady Bunch. He passed away many years ago, and I never had the opportunity to have an adult conversation with him about these things. As I mentioned, when my parents met, I was an infant. My sister was six. When we moved into that home, my sister told my mom several times that she saw fire in the windows. 
She said that she would look at the window and see flames in it, but there was no fire. My mom believed 100% that the house was haunted, but I don't know. This house was in town, but the backyard was a hobby farm, a shed for my stepbrother's horse, a chicken coop, a large garden. This yard abutted a cemetery. We played there a lot as kids. We left that house when I was five and moved to a cattle farm. If you believe in these kinds of things, I feel the conditions were prime for paranormal activity. The house was torn down a few years ago. The story also takes place in rural Missouri around 1988. It was an evening in October, and we were driving to a town about 45 minutes away to see my cousins play in a college basketball game. Living in a rural area meant long drives on winding roads through farmland and wooded areas. My mom was driving, and my aunt, the same aunt, was the passenger in our Ford Bronco. In the back were two of my classmates on either side of me. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. We were excited to see the basketball game and probably talking about boy bands. I noticed something off to the left in the woods. I said, hey, look, I see some Christmas lights over there, but isn't it kind of early to put up Christmas lights? My mom and aunt asked what I was talking about. There aren't any houses over there. Are you sure you saw Christmas lights? I said, yes, look, they're still there. Everyone looked out the left side of the car. About 10 feet from the road was something that looked like a single strand of old-fashioned multicolored outdoor Christmas lights with huge bulbs. I said, it looks like the lights are following us. We were traveling at least 45 miles per hour. All five of us saw this. The lights continued to keep pace with us through the trees and hills. Then the lights shot straight up into the air. I yelled, they're gone! What do you mean they're gone? My mom yelled, trying to keep her eyes on the road and the strange lights. My aunt pointed at the night sky in front of us and gasped, look! When the strand of lights flew out of the woods and into the sky, several crafts with red lights appeared. The Christmas lights crafts and the crafts with red lights moved around in zigzag formations at unfathomable speeds. I said, are, are they putting on a show? My mom said, it looks like they're having a dogfight. She swears she saw activity between crafts, as in something being fired like a laser or weapon, but I don't recall that. My friend on the left burst into tears, terrified. My friend on the right covered her eyes and refused to watch. I don't know what that is. I don't want to look. She has never willingly admitted to this experience, and I don't hold it against her. I lost touch with the friend who was scared witless. I doubt she ever told anyone. I can't remember if we stopped the car or kept going, but we watched this display until one of the crafts shot straight up, followed by the others until they vanished. I don't remember the basketball game, or who won. Of course, we can't explain what we saw, but we saw it. I haven't seen anything like that before or since. I hope you enjoyed my stories. There are more where those came from that I am happy to share in the future. Fireside Frights is one of my favorite things about this podcast. I hope it continues. Everyone has stories to share, and I hope they will. Wow, thank you so much, Sarah. I appreciate that. Uh, yes, Fireside Frights will continue. In fact, there is talk of us actually making a book series from the Fireside Frights. Like maybe, uh, it'd be like an online e-reader book only. Uh, it wouldn't be worth it in paperback because they'd be so short. But we're thinking about maybe like making an, an e-version of each week, or, or excuse me, each Fireside Frights episode as its own book. We're talking about it anyway. So yeah, we definitely are going to keep this up. And, and more than anything else, I just love uh, getting the stories from all of you. Um, it's great for me to find those articles and stories and, and give you the typical Weird Darkness episodes. But I really love the personal stories that you send to me because they also come with the personal comments. And this way I'm also able to kind of react to them because I try not to read them before I record Fireside Frights. So that way my reaction is genuine. And that way if I have anything to say about it afterwards, it just comes out you know, off the cuff. And it's just a lot of fun that way. So uh, as much as you like them, I like them uh, for some of the same reasons. So that's it. That's the end of, end of uh, our stories for this episode. Again, thank you for listening. If you like Fireside Frights as well as Weird Darkness, please share this, uh, this podcast with somebody you know who loves the paranormal and strange stories, true crime, monsters, and unsolved mysteries just like you do. 
And please, if you're listening to the podcast, leave a rating and a review of the show in the podcast app that you listen from. Doing so helps the show to get noticed. You can also email me anytime with your questions or comments, not necessarily with a story, but if you just want to email me for any reason, you can do that uh, on the contact page at WeirdDarkness.com. But that, uh, that contact page, it's also where you can find all of my social media. Uh, plus, you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated on the website. You can shop the Weird Darkness store where, of course, all profits I receive go to help those who are struggling with depression. Uh, you can sign up for the email newsletter. You can find other podcasts that I host, like Allegedly and also The Church of the Undead, which I promise is coming back. I just have to build up some of the content again after that computer crash, but Church of the Undead is coming back. Um, and of course, at WeirdDarkness.com, you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or somebody you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, I need stories for the next Fireside Frights. I am now officially out of stories. So go to WeirdDarkness.com and click on Tell Your Story and please send it in. All stories, of course, in Weird Darkness, especially on Fireside Frights episodes, are purported to be true. And all of them were submitted by listeners like you. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. James 3, verses 17 and 18. The wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. And a final thought from Thomas A. Kempis. The acknowledgement of our weakness is the first step in repairing our loss. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.